Hi, and welcome to the Mason Miller Show. It's Clay Miller, your co-host today, uh, with another special edition uh, as we come up on a March 19th election. Uh, we were able to, unfortunate enough, to get Marsha Webb to join us today. Marsha, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me, Clay. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So, Marsha is a Republican candidate for the uh, Illinois State Representative for District 107. So, um, what are, what is the borders of, of the district, approximately? Well, the borders have really changed since the redistricting, mm -hmm. of what I call the gerrymandering of the map. Um, so there's the north-south um, Cadwell Road in Moultrie County. That would be the eastern part of Moultrie, um, then basically all the rest of it. Uh, there's parts of Macon County, and it's, it's really chopped up there. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of Mount Zion, um, Sand Creek Road, and then it jumps all the way over to the south side of um, Rock Springs Road. Then it jumps on down to Blue Mound and Macon, and also Elwyn. And as you know, it's basically all of Shelby County. Uh, there's parts of Taylorville uh, in Christian County, in Tower Hill, Haina, and then... And which is Calhoun, and get, does it get all the way, it gets all the way down to uh, Altamont? Yes. And then over to... To Effingham and T-Town. T-Town. Yes. Okay. Um, and then up, and then back up through to Strong, Windsor, um, mm -hmm. up and on up to Neoga and Cumberland, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Cumberland okay. County, uh, the Neoga area, and then in Montgomery County, there is Nokomis and Witt. Oh, okay. There's actually seven counties involved. Yeah, pieces, some some holes, some part. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's interesting. Uh, that's a pretty pretty uh, good sized geography to, to try to cover, so. It is, um, it is. Okay, well that helps. Um, can you share a little bit about just your background and uh, you know, where you live and what you've done and how you, uh, how you arrived at the point you decided to enter into this? Absolutely, well, first and foremost, I wanna say that I am a wife, a mother, and a grandmother of three beautiful granddaughters. And that's the main reason. That is our future, and I'm running to fight for our future. I am a former first responder, firefighter, paramedic. As a matter of fact, I was stationed in Shelbyville uh, for Decatur Ambulance Service. Oh, really? Yes, and I really enjoyed being down here. And I also filled in uh, shifts in Pena, so I'm familiar with the area. And I've worked with the dive team on a couple calls down here. So I just want to say I fully support the dive team. Right. Uh, I, Where, where's home for you? I live in Macon. I, okay. I grew up born and raised in Sullivan. Right. Um, I had family members in Shelby County. My cousin's husband was the police chief in Finley, uh, Don Highland. Okay. Uh, a lot of people do remember Don. And uh, my uncle and aunt had the farm in Strasburg. Their son and daughter-in-law and two sons right here in Shelbyville. She was the director of nursing at Shelby Memorial. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I've got roots. I say a lot of roots in, uh, in not just in, in uh, Shelby County, but all around uh, your district, I guess. Yes, yes. I also served as the volunteer chaplain for the Macon County Sheriff's Department Patrol Division. Thoroughly enjoyed that, being out with the deputies and, and as a first responder on the fire and, and EMS side, you work hand in hand with them. And you've got a really good idea at that point what our first responders, our law enforcement officers face. Mm -hmm. But you get in that squad car and you do eight hour shifts with them you get a deep understanding of it. And given that diverse background, yeah. that is what earned the um, trust. I've earned the trust and the endorsement of the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police State Lodge. Oh, very so, nice. I bet you were thrilled to get that. I was thrilled, but yet very humbled. And a lot of 
people running for office, they get endorsements and it's a feather in their cap. Right. Well, I take this very seriously. I mean, there's almost 36,000 law enforcement officers, active and retired, that belong to that uh, fraternal order of police. That's a great responsibility. Yeah, no doubt. You know, so it's a little bit unique, I, I would think, that you um, were part of a fire department and a first responder. Um, what? How did you arrive at that? I mean, was it something you always wanted to do, or how did you, uh, tell us about how you got into that. Oh, I'm going to uh, date myself here. <laughs> um, there was a show called Emergency in the 70s. And of course, Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto, they were the heart throbs of the grade school and high school girls. And that, that show was responsible for the paramedic program and EMS programs across the United States. Mm -hmm. And I had a cousin that was a fire chief and I'm like, I wanna be Johnny Gage. I want to do that. I wanna be a firefighter. I wanna be a paramedic. And you know, life tends to get in the way and you have kids and then when our youngest uh, was junior high, high school, I'm like, I'm already an EMT basic. I'm gonna be Johnny Gage. I'm going on for my paramedic. Yeah. So I achieved that that lifelong goal. Well, and you had to, I would think, uh, you had to be an extreme minority at that time to be doing that. I mean, it was pretty much a male-dominated um, when I first profession, started. I would think, yeah. I mean, nothing like today where, yeah, it's not uncommon at all, but back, um, in the yeah, 80s. Absolutely. The yeah. early 80s. You were some of the first uh, females probably to really start doing that, especially out in, in smaller rural areas. Absolutely. I was. Um, and I guess that's where I get my tenacity, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that, and my fight. Um, being the only female in a predominantly male field, as you said. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to get out there and duke it out with the best of them and keep up with them. Get, get thick skin and approve yourself, but I, apparently you earned their respect to, to wind up, one, having the career you had, and then now to have uh, the, the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police, that's a great, that's a great um, I guess, testament to, to where you are and what you've accomplished. Very humbling. Great. Um, so have you ever held elected office before? Yes, I currently do. I am a South Macon Township trustee and I was appointed by the Macon County Board Chairman to the Macon County Board of Health. Okay. And how long have you, how long have you held those roles? Well, this is my second term uh, with the Board of Trustees and I am currently in, I filled a vacated seat. And so this is like term and a half mm -hmm. on okay. the Board of Health. So going from that to, you know, stepping in to, to pursue the, uh, again, as a Republican, the uh, state representative uh, of one of seven, what, what, uh, what made you jump into that race and decide, you know, this is for me at, uh, at this time? I cannot sit back and complain and be a keyboard warrior. I, I can't do it. Um, there's so much broke in our state that needs fixed. And I feel that I can help. I, I'm not the answer for the state, mm -hmm. but um, my willingness to sit down and talk to people, regardless of their party affiliation. A state representative represents everybody, mm -hmm. not just the Republicans. You represent Republican, Democrat, Independent, and you cannot be disrespectful. You cannot be dismissive. How do you know what the issues in your district are if you don't sit down and have the conversations with them? And, you know, my opponent touts has, that he's got the most conservative score in the General Assembly. Well, you can achieve that if all you do is set down and vote no. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to work within your own party 
and you have to be able to reach across the aisle to the other side. You may not, you may not get a win, but maybe you can lessen the impact. I think that's something that is so lost. And again, I feel like we're in this trifecta of, um, so we've got the national um, political situation, which in my opinion, it, it couldn't be much worse or more poorly managed um, uh, you know, nationally. Then we live in Illinois, which you know, is uh, in, in a tight race, a three-way race to be the most mismanaged state in the country, I feel like. Uh, when you look at the statistics between New York, California, and Illinois, um, they're all doing a wonderful job of the race to the bottom. And then, um, then you look at some of the things that maybe, uh, you know, locally that we can we can impact and hopefully do better. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, to improve, but one thing that I've noticed, you know, anxious to see if you feel the same way, but it used to be growing up, I can remember uh, whether you were Democrat, Republican, Independent, uh, there was a group of ideas and um, common themes that everyone agreed on, regardless of, mm -hmm. you know, that you always support the military. You, you know, the things that were American ideals, not necessarily even hardly debatable, um, freedom, you know, choice, you know, your ability to make your own choices, um, things like that, where it seems like that's even become cloudy now. And a lot of, a lot of work was done and good things were done through compromise. Um, I remember, uh, I was pretty little then, but I remember um, when Ronald Reagan was president and Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. you couldn't have a more conservative Republican and a more liberal Democrat, but they were great friends, even though they disagreed on 75% of things, but they compromised and came together and got so much done. Absolutely. Because it wasn't exactly the what, what the Republicans wanted, and it wasn't exactly what the Democrats wanted, but they would come together and each give a little, and it probably ended up being the right thing most of the time. You're absolutely right. Patriotism mm -hmm. was still alive. And when I say patriotism, I'm not talking about the extreme right or the extreme left. Our politics, on a national and state level have become so divisive that we the people, the very people that put them in office are suffering. Nothing is getting done. And that's where we have to, we, we've got to get back. And, and when, when I say JFK, that was before me. I mean, unfortunately he was assassinated a month before I was born, but the JFK all the way through the Reagan years. I'm I'm a Reaganite. I, I loved his policies and I I remember you know the great shape that our nation was in. We have to stop being petulant children, throwing fits, and it's gonna be my way or the highway, because you're not getting anything done for your constituents. And that's what it's about. It's not about the representative or the senator or or whatever office. Right. It's about doing the right thing for your constituents. And see, there's, when I say sit down, reach across the aisle, you can maintain your integrity. Exactly. You can maintain what you stand for. When I say that, you know, it's not being a sellout. Right. It's not compromising in your core beliefs. Um, Correct. And again, somewhere along the line, it became, I mean, you know, even even in, in my early years, you know, there were a lot of friends and family and, and things like that that were, you know, whether, whether they were Democrats, Republicans, independents, whatever, even though they, they didn't agree on everything, but they still respected each other. And it wasn't like, I can't be friends with you. I don't like you because you voted for one person or another, or it makes you a bad person. So Marsha, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, the size of the, the geographic size of District 107. Um, how have you managed to get around all the communities and what have you learned from uh, all the all the unique, you know, little towns uh, that make up our, our district? Well, first of all, I've been, I've been welcomed. Uh, I've met a lot of great people and I'm thankful for that. And I've actually made friendships along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even after the election, those friendships are going to be there. 
But there's a resounding theme that I'm picking up. People need relief, and they want honesty and integrity, and they want their voices heard, and they want their voices taken over to Springfield. They feel unrepresented. They feel unheard. They feel like their voice and it just doesn't matter. So we've, we've got to fix that. How, how do you, so, you know, you've got a lot of different city councils, uh, county boards, um, and then various other, you know, civic elected boards and, and appointed people and all that in this district. What's your role um, if you were to be an, um, elected as a state representative, do you feel with these community, um, you know, city councils, county boards, so on and so forth? Number one rule as a state representative or senator or, you know, at the state level, you do not interfere in the local issues. If they reach out to you and they ask, what should I do? Or, hey, we need a grant. We need this. Whatever it is, you offer them resources, you offer them contacts, but you should not be in the middle of the local politics. Mm-hmm. Well, you can see, I mean, I'm sure every um, town and county has their own set of issues to deal with. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you think there, are, and maybe there are, maybe there aren't, I don't know, are there opportunities for dis- this District 107 to get more, whether it be funding or support or grants, something like that from the state level um, funneled into some of these communities in in any capacities? I mean, does anything come to your mind um, of where we could potentially uh, do a better job with that? I think there is funding out there, you know, critical infrastructure or you know, I, I know of, of one lady that's trying to get uh, child care. Um, her community is a, a child care desert. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, she reached out to me and I called the senator. The senator got involved and there is funding out there. So that's, you have to be willing to reach out. You have to be willing to research. Where's the resources for these folks? Mm -hmm. What can I do? And again, you talk within your own party, you reach across the aisle. It's hard work to do it right. I would imagine to be real honest. And it it is. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a true commitment. um, I would think as far as it's not a, you know, even even at a county board or a city, you know, all the people that donate their time, I mean, it is fantastic that they do that, on, that they're serving the community in some way. This truly is a, a more than full-time uh, job. That's for sure to do it right, I would say, is once you get to the state representative level. You, you said it, to do it right. Because a lot of people look at your state representative or your, your senator uh, positions, oh, well, that's a part-time job. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're only in session, you know, from this date to this date, and then they take their their break, and then they come back for the fall veto and everything. If your elected officials, if your state representative is doing the job right, it's not a part-time job. Just because you're not in session, it's not vacation time. <laughs> I would think when you're out of session, that's probably your busiest time because that's when you need to be getting around to all of your constituents to make sure that they see you, they know that you are involved, you're listening to them so that Mm -hmm. you're getting all your, basically, uh, your roadmap for what you're going to try to do when you get back to Springfield and what needs to be done. Absolutely. If you're not meeting with your constituents when you're not in session and you're not listening to them, you don't you don't have the pulse of the of the district right you have to know what what resources are needed or what what their struggles are you have to you have to make yourself available regular yeah. office hours traveling office hours where you don't have have an office and in me i mean just as a candidate traveling throughout the 107th i can't tell you how many people have my phone number mm-hmm 
you know, I'm always listening. I'm always available. My my phone rings up till I silence it at midnight, and then it starts again at 6 a.m. And and I'm not saying that as a state rep you should be calling your your state representative at midnight, but if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Yeah, I I, I can't imagine it's uh, not only a big geography, but it's a lot of um, a lot of constituents that you would be representing. So, mm-hmm. um, one last question in this segment. Um, term limits, we hear a lot about that. If you were elected, what, what would you see this, the road being as far as, are there a certain many of years or terms you would do this or are you, is it a see as I go or do this and then eventually try to take a, another step up the ladder? I mean, what's kind of your, your vision? My vision is I have taken the U.S. term limit pledge and the Illinois term limit pledge. So with doing that, I have those two organizations to hold me accountable to my term limit pledge plus my constituents. Which one is that that pledge? My pledge is four terms. Okay. So for a state rep, that's eight years. Because this is my personal belief. If that's all the United States president can serve, that that should be across the board. Get done what you can get done in this role for eight years and then, or yes. less, and then step out and let someone else have a shot? Absolutely. Bring fresh energy. See, without the term limits, a lot of the elected officials, they become uh, a monarch. They feel entitled and they feel untouchable. <laughs> I mean, and this well, is how we get the career politicians that are in office doing absolutely nothing other than infighting. We've got one of the longest, in, being in the state of Illinois, we've got one of the longest serving senators um, in the United States. And I don't know how you could possibly, my, this is my personal view, obviously, I don't know how you can possibly have any concept of what your constituents are going through in the real world if you've been in Washington solely or Springfield or whatever um, for decades. No idea. How, how can they possibly know what, um, you know, the person that has a business downtown is trying to go through uh, through this mm-hmm. economy uh, and survive through COVID? I mean, they can say they do, but it, it's supposed to be, you know, the Founding Fathers set this up as a public servant. Correct. Meaning what their vision was, was you you do something they were all something else and then they went to washington or you go to springfield and you quote unquote serve do your time and then you go back to your life it's not a forever this isn't an occupation forever uh it's you're serving you're donating some of your time and expertise and then you go back to your regular life and that's been lost i believe it absolutely has been lost and one of the reasons that I actually took the pledge was to hold me accountable. You know, my opponent, he took a, a, a break, but he was given, you know, he was recognized in the General Assembly, and they wished him good luck to him and Linda. Okay, so he was in, he was out. Oh, I'm back again. And then he made the, the term limit pledge um, of, of a total of five terms. So. And how many terms? This is there? his fifth. Oh. And, you know, he told everybody, I can't run again. This is it. This is my term limit pledge. Five terms. I'm out. Um, one of the Lincoln Day dinners, and I was in attendance. Um, you know, he was given a congressional proclamation he was given a house proclamation and the central committee was giving him gifts and thanking him well that was I believe in February don't quote me but I think it was in February I he knew I was um going to run I had had a two-hour meeting with him he told me how to launch my campaign step by step starting you know starting you've got to get your FEIN you've got to get your committee Mm -hmm. and the list went on And I called him and said, April 25th, I'm announcing. Didn't uh, 
hear anything from him after that phone conversation. I announced on April 25th on June 2nd, I got the text message. My intent is to seek re-election, and within an hour, he had his <laughs> re-election. Um, what changed? Uh, I guess I, I that's, mean, that's that's it. A um, for you. you know, I I uh, had a phone conversation with him on June 3rd. Uh, you know, and I'm I I asked him that. I said, Brad, what what's going on? You know, what has changed? And the comment I got was staggering. It was, Marcia, we don't pick our replacements, but, and the sentence stopped there. <laughs> you know, who, who? I would agree with that. You don't pick your replacements. The voters do. Absolutely. You know, the, the voters, the voters absolutely pick who they want to represent. And if you don't back out and bow down, your supporters, you know, are, are bullied, coerced, the candidate being me, you know, desperately trying to get me to back out. Hmm. Uh, you know, phone calls from his fellow general assemblyman, let's put it that way, making phone calls uh, to others. You offer her a staff job. You get her out of the race. It's your fault she's running. You know, keep her out of Shelby County. <laughs> this one was the best. Keep her out of Shelby County and Shelbyville. She's upsetting Brad. So this leads me to how do you fund a campaign? And I know we need to take a break here, but I want to ask this because you've made me think of this as you, as you kick this off and are trying to do it. How do you fund a campaign like this? Well, mine is a grassroots campaign a true grassroots campaign do you know like what's the biggest amount of money you've gotten from any one person or group off the top of your head uh sixty nine hundred dollars is what an individual um can give Mm -hmm. so um i've i've had some of those but they're from individuals are they from um within the district yes okay yes um Every penny of my campaign contributions that have come to me, other than, and I can't, I, I can't say they're outside because there's many um, Illinois FOP fraternal right. order police members in the 107th, but every penny of mine has come from supporters. Bottom line is, it's a grassroots, um, and I'm asking you these questions authentically you and I have never spoken in, in our life other than maybe I don't know honestly if maybe I've been introduced to you like once and said hello but that's it so yes we haven't no. had a conversation no and we never give questions before uh hand so I'm just curious when I'm asking this because it has to take a lot of money to run so you're saying every single person or money that you've gotten has come within this district or it's been someone like the FOP or something that, that has endorsed you mm-hmm. no money from a group, a pack, anything else that is out of state, um, out of, you know, outside of this Illinois area. Um, that is correct. Okay. That is correct. So, um, you know, and anyone that wants to look at the contributions, they can go to illinoisunshine.org. It's not a comprehensive list as if you go onto the Illinois State Board of Elections you can look at all the reporting. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look up a candidate. It's, it's called an A1. Uh, that is all contributions in. Or you, and if you want to see, oh, well, what are they spending their money on, uh, at the same website, Illinois State Board of Elections, uh, you look at their B1. That's all expenditures. And any group, correct me if I'm wrong, that spends $5,000 or more must register as well correct that is correct any individual any group okay yes um interesting so grassroots that's how you're getting it done um i would be it it's concerning to me when um groups outside of an area or a state um want to start giving money and impacting um sometimes it's okay but um to me it's almost like uh people from outside the united states 
contributing money to a national election. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, I would really want to know more about that and why that is. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I appreciate that you're not getting uh, any money from outside. So Not at all. Not at all. And, you know, you say you stand for affordable energy. Well, if you do that, why are you taking contributions from Ameren and ComEd? ComEd in Chicago. Right. You know, uh, I'm not going to get too far into that. I, I, I'm I, not taking any of those. But, again, I, I urge the listeners to go to the websites and look. Be careful who you take money from because – your phone will ring at some point down the road, mm-hmm. um, when, especially from a group. And, I mean, people can say they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. I, I guess maybe I'm too cynical for that. Um, there will be, if it's a big group, a company, there's going to be something down the road that they're going to uh, want from you, in my opinion. Again, I'm not saying it's happened. I'm just saying we're, we all we're born in the dark, but it wasn't last night. So that's my concern. Absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> in me and, and my own convictions and ideology, I don't owe anybody anything other than my constituents, the very ones that are going to send me to Springfield. That's where my loyalty lies. It's not with mega donors it's not with companies <laughs> or 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 with a caucus but i th- think that that's I terrifying to i think that's terrifying to the establishment because then as we've seen people who are truly independent and aren't part of the machine at whatever level how do you control them they're going to actually you're going to operate how you think is best as opposed to feeling like you have to toe a certain line. Well, you become a puppet to the puppeteers. And, you know, and and I'm sorry, I'm just going to say this. I probably shouldn't. But my opponent asked, you know, when he was asked by a newspaper, you know, the Champagne Journal Gazette, I've got it on on my Facebook page, you know, why are you not – honoring your term limit pledge. Well, he gives some excuse that that if you that seniority matters and he looks at the I I don't know if he said the word youthfulness, but um, it implied that of the Freedom Caucus. Well, the Freedom Caucus is a group of seven state representatives for Illinois, the Illinois Freedom Caucus. Where's your loyalty? You made a term limit pledge to your constituents, and you know, you're going to break that to be loyal to a group of seven? Yeah. Yeah, I see your point. I th- you know, I understand the seniority, the experience, the time and role, but I would always um, defer, whether it's business, whether it's... Um, you know, I don't care if it's a team, a sport, it, uh, politics, whatever. Quality over quantity always. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And seniority brings stagnation. It, it really does. There is a danger in, um, in, in getting into a, a certain pattern, um, again, without an influx of new thoughts, new ideas, new energies, um, not just in politics, I think in anything, you know, um, change your job, change jobs and, uh, be scared for a little while and, but you're invigorated and it, and it stretches you and, and pushes you. And I think the same thing is true when, if you jump into something like you're doing, you know, you'll, um, you'll shake things up, you'll bring new ideas. Uh, you're not jaded by, uh, what I think you probably would be six, eight years into that role. Mm-hmm. We went a little longer. We wanted to here, but I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the candid uh, conversation. So we're going to take a little break and we'll be back with more from Marsha Webb, a Republican candidate for the Illinois State Representative District 107. Uh, in just a moment. Hi, this is Carol Cole from Jake's Antiques. If you're looking for a unique shopping experience, come see us at 1717 West Main in Shelbyville, where we showcase the best of old and new in one location. 
We offer a large selection of antiques, reproductions, and colorful garden art. Come see us Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Welcome back to the Mason Miller Show. Um, Clay Miller, co-host, uh, and today I'm speaking with Marsha Webb, Republican candidate for the Illinois State Representative District uh, 107. Again, uh, the election primary is coming up on March 19th, Tuesday, so be sure and get out and uh, vote. So, Marsha, I want to jump into some other things. Yeah, you know, we talked about kind of how you've gotten into this race, what you've done, how you've got a grassroots uh, effort really to, to fund this campaign. So, I wanted to pivot a little bit to what last month Governor Pritzker gave, you know, his General Assembly, addressed the General Assembly and kind of laid out, I think, um, him being the leader of the Democratic Party for Illinois and the governor, uh, what the priorities are for and kind of the state of the state and the priorities for the year. And, you know, I, I kind of glanced through these and picked off a couple of things that I would like to, to get your thoughts on. So, you know, obviously... He touted the belief and the progress uh, they made over the budget and the fiscal position of the state. One, I think whoever's in office is always going to try to to say that things are a lot better since they've been there. I mean, that's just uh, politics. But, you know, the fiscal state of the state probably is better than it was, meaning absolutely horrific to slightly better than horrific is an improvement. So I wanted to get your take on that and kind of where you think just the state of Illinois as a whole and their fiscal responsibility. What sort of grade would you give that? I'd give it an F. (laughs) I'm sorry. Uh, So if it wasn't for the federal COVID bailout money, we would still be at horrific fail. Until we see relief on our taxes and we start seeing these tax rates go down or they stop taxing everything we touch, everything we taste and breathe, it's, it's not going to get any better. Yeah. We, we need true relief. And I know that this, in, in the current environment in Springfield, we can't get it done, especially all at once. It it would be a little bit at a time. And as I told you, I'm a Reaganite. Do you remember Reagan's approach that, that brought us from the brink of a depression? Do you remember how he did that? It's still, I mean, it's common sense to me. Um, I, I honestly, I f- it's very difficult for me to even understand how you can think other than this. And I know that's a dangerous th- way to be when we're talking about compromise and seeing. I, I would love for people to try to explain why that what you're talking about doesn't work. Because it's if you tax people less, tax companies less, reduce regulation and Absolutely. allow innovation and allow people to expand their businesses, their companies, start a company, an idea, whatever, things will flourish. You will generate more tax revenue and collect more taxes if you lower taxes. And it's been shown over mm. and over again. Every time we've done it, the economy takes off. Absolutely. And and I've said this a lot of times uh, when I've been out speaking. President Reagan they, they took the projected tax income and reduced it by 17%. Everybody came to the table. They had to prove the portion of what was there. There was no pork. There was no pet projects. Mm-hmm. And then they gave that 17% tax reduction to the pe- taxpayers, to the American people. Mm-hmm. Why can't that work in Illinois? I mean, I, I don't think there's any question. Um, I, I mean, I would challenge any of them to say, try that for two years and tell me if we're not in a better position than we are right now, I'll, I'll never talk about it again, but I promise you we would be. Yes. So in 19, so in 2021, and I just looked these up, according to the U.S. Census, the IRS, literally moving companies like U-Haul yes. said um, in 2021, 146,000 people left the state of Illinois. 208 companies left in 2021, Mm -hmm. 208. And that doesn't include like big companies that just relocated their, moved their headquarters out or Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, say a, a Walmart closed three stores or something. That doesn't, that's not talking about them. These are companies that actually said, yeah, we're done in the state of Illinois. We're leaving. Mm-hmm. And they went somewhere else. And I know that they've said, you know, the De- Democrats have said, and Governor Pritzker has said, oh, they're, it's people retiring or it's, it's no. a misnomer. That's absolutely 100% false. If you look at the data, they're not all fleeing and retirees going to Florida. There are some of that. The majority, though, are going to the states right around us. There are literally people are moving and they're going to Iowa and Indiana and Missouri and Kentucky and Tennessee, simply showing you we just got to get out of this overregulated, overtaxed state that is so unbusiness friendly. So the numbers you just gave, to put that in contrast to everybody, every year we're losing that amount of people. That is the population of a town the size of Springfield. So every year we're losing Springfield mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to put that in perspective. Or the so, population of your district that you're wanting to uh, represent, uh, basically. Uh, yes, absolutely. So if this continues, it's going to be the last one out, turn the lights out. And the people who move... I would bet, this is, I don't have the facts to back this, uh, back this up, but one, 208 companies and 146,000 people, the 146,000 people who moved actually have the resources to be able to move. Mm-hmm. So I would bet that's middle class and beyond, which they pay the most in taxes, which is probably why they're saying, I'm done, I'm out of here. So again, that's, that's like a double whammy because they're probably taking jobs with them and they're not... Mm-hmm buying cars and homes and, um, you know, they're not raising their kids here and sending them to state colleges here. You know, all that, all those unintended consequences and ramifications, domino effects, um, have to be worsening the impact, I would think. It is. And those that, that can't get out, um, that, that can't move out of Illinois, that lost revenue, those last, those lost taxes, they have to come from somewhere. So exactly. guess who? Guess whose shoulders, whose pocketbook that 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 deficit is now falling on. Right. So there's 208 less companies every year for these folks to go get jobs and work in. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's to me, it's the biggest issue I think in these states. And again, um, we Illinois was third uh, behind behind New York and California in the exodus Mm -hmm. um actually and if you do it by per million people illinois was actually second um as far as hemorrhaging people um so again what's the common theme there (laughs) all three of those states when i always say it's a race to the bottom it's completely complete fiscal mismanagement in my opinion well that's my opinion also um and again that's an opinion um we just have to get common sense back to the table. Right. And I'm a firm believer any any legislation that that is drawn up and voted on your legislators cannot be the expert on every subject. You have to bring the experts to the table. Just like the egregious safety act that the, the has been coined the unsafety act what it has done to our law enforcement Mm -hmm. uh, our judicial system our circuit clerks offices there is no way that the very people that that it was affecting that those experts were brought to the table and that's something that has to be done and i'm a realist super minority i I get sent to Springfield, I'm in the super minority. But I'm willing to reach across the aisle, I'm w- without compromising, okay, right. and chip away at it, one one chip at a time. But before I go to that table, I'm going to be calling for a meeting, the sheriff's offices, you know, hey, sheriff, can you come to this meeting? Our state's attorneys, can you come to this meeting? Our circuit clerks, do you, okay. So 
the circuit clerk's office is the hub of the judicial system. It's what keeps that courthouse going round and round. Mm -hmm. Do you know, since the no cash bail in the Safety Act, circuit clerks in Illinois are losing millions of dollars because they don't have that 10% of the bail. So... Where is that going to be made up? Absolutely. So there's more jobs left or lost. It compromises how, you know, the the circuit clerk in the courthouse goes round and round. Well... That, that particular act is a great example of unintended consequences and not fully understanding what the impact is. And, and there's all kinds of different impacts, and you've, you've laid one out. Another one is forcing your local law enforcement that you've, we've grown up with, that we've we hired we, you know, as taxpayers, and putting them in almost an impossible situation to make criminals out of people that are, are normal law-abiding citizens. And then also, mm-hmm. on the flip side, people who have broken the law that have no, I mean, they're back out before, faster than 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 the police can even get them in and processed. I mean, and they turn right back around and, and these folks are free. A lot of them are out the door. You know, they're given their NTA, their notice to appear. They're out before the officer could complete his report for yeah. the arrest. And there's there's a, a dire consequence in that that part of the Safety Act. And um, through meeting with our law enforcement and, and meetings with, you know, the Fraternal Order of Police, we are, we are getting close to a law enforcement crisis because as soon as they're able to retire, they're retiring or they're leaving Illinois and, and they're going to neighboring states to be police officers or they're leaving the profession altogether. And so there's less and less law enforcement officers. And so you've got people that young, you know, young college age that wanted to be police officers, they're looking at a what complete disaster and mess this is. So they're not they're they're not getting into the profession. So it's affecting the recruitment. The PTI, right. Police Training Institute, those classes are getting smaller and smaller. And I can remember even 20 years ago, if you wanted to be a law enforcement officer, especially in Illinois State Police, well good luck. The, right. the the waiting list. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was it was deep. It mm-hmm. was it was huge, um, and you know they they had large PTI classes. So that's another unintended uh, consequence. I I would bet that a large percentage, a significant percentage of first responders, um, are are second or third generation too. Uh, and and absolutely. I'll bet so many of those are saying don't go into the telling their kids don't don't do this because of the experience they're in whereas you mentioned some of those men and women might be far enough into their career where they got to stick it out because they got to get to their pension but the ones that have a lot of promise maybe they're in their 20s and early 30s they're still thinking i've got such a long road to go i'm out i'm gonna go just change professions entirely because Mm -hmm. it has to get so uh it has to be just so discouraging and daunting to try to do your job and and then there's no I mean it's the same repeat offenders over and over or there's no crime there's no penalty for breaking laws so I mean I think it would have to wear on you mentally the problem I have is they feel like it's going to be he's saying oh you know we're going to balance budgets and remain fiscally responsible Our tax base is eroding inflation's up gas is more mm-hmm. um, groceries are more utilities are more education, secondary education tuitions goes up every year. Tell me how things are going to be better two years from out in the state of Illinois on a certain path. I don't see it. In, until we rein in the reckless spending, um, it, it's not. It, we're, we're not going to see improvement, and we're going to continue spiraling downward. Yeah. Um, uh, just one or two other things here. I know we're, we're getting along and you have a, you have another um, appointment you need mm-hmm. to get to. So we'll try to get you out of here in the next couple of uh, few minutes here, but two things, 
we touched on the public safety issue. It says, um, you know, they talked about spending money for trying to get more officers uh, in, in some of the in equipment and some of these lo- at the local level. Mm-hmm. As you know, our sheriff's department here, again, and, and you're bigger than just Shelby County, obviously, but that, that's where I reside. So the, Sh- the Shelby County Sheriff's Department, from what I understand, and I've not looked at these figures myself, is that they are on the lower end, the deputies of, of pay, and their pay was decreased because it had been bumped up with some COVID money, and that COVID money is no longer being paid to them. Again, is my understanding. Is it possible with this money that's being put out there that they're saying to be able to recruit and retain officers on a local level? Like, is that something that if you were elected, you could potentially go out there and try to get to help subsidize some of these local county police departments? I would absolutely advocate for that. Um, I had worked with your current state representative, went to him for legislation for the volunteer fire departments Mm -hmm. uh, to to get a tax break for them. Unfortunately, that didn't go through. But then, um, and I and I don't care. I do not care that it was you know the uh, a Democrat legislator. He picked it up. And changed a few things in it, lowered the tax deduction amount, and it passed. So, absolutely, I would advocate, you know, for some kind of funding or grants or, you know, that that wouldn't have a negative impact on our tax dollars, you know, raising your taxes. Right. There's, there's got to be a pile of cash sitting on the shelf somewhere for someone's pet project. Mm-hmm. There always is uh, that that could be used for that. We, we have to have law and order. We are a state. We are a country of law and order. Without our law enforcement officers, you know, right. it, it leaves uh, the citizens at great risk. Well, I, there's about five other things that come to mind that I would love to talk to you about, but I know you've got to get on. Um, you, you've got to um, go meet with some other constituents, so I don't want to hold you up there, and I want to make sure that uh, everybody gets time with you. So any anything that you want to talk about just real quickly or address before we uh, sign off here? Yes. It, it's election season. So many of them say, I'm against this. I stand against this. I fight for this. Where's their plan? You know, I am unapologetically pro-life, but I also understand how divisive that is. It divides families, friendships, uh, politically. Look look how divided we are politically over pro-choice, pro-life. I have a plan, you know, without raising our taxes. You know, Illinois has become the abortion capital of the Midwest, and it's our tax dollars. I want to take 50% of those tax dollars already set aside and move it over to make adoption free in Illinois. That will not raise your taxes. That's, you know, tax money already sitting there. Thousands of parents looking for uh, wanting to adopt kids every year. And they, they can afford to raise a child, but they cannot afford the thousands of dollars at one time to you know, go through to the process. Adopt. Right. Exactly. And nobody should have to purchase their children. So this accomplishes several things. It gives the expectant mother a choice. Um, it's going to save lives. And it's helping those young couples that cannot afford to adopt. I think it's a great idea. It's a wonderful idea. And I think you have a unique perspective on this being one, someone who's been on the outside. Now you're trying to step into political office. Two, being a mother and a grandmother. I mean, I think it gives you a unique perspective um, on what a woman would potentially, a young lady would be going through in trying to navigate this decision and how maybe it could be what what is seen as an unfortunate event could actually be a, a really great event for parents out there. If abortion was legal in the 60s, I quite possibly would not be sitting here talking to you. I uh, was given up for adoption and my parents adopted me at less than a week old. Wow. So, you know, this is something very near and dear and personal to me. And again, I really 
did not know you before today. I didn't was not lobbying you a softball. I had no idea. That's that's really interesting. So yes. again, really do have a good perspective on this. Yes. I love the idea. So Yes. Thanks so much for coming in and talking to us today. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, I have too. So um, again, Marsha Webb running for the uh, 107th District uh, State Representative uh, as a Republican. If you want to know more, definitely reach out to her. Again, election day is March Tuesday, March 19th. Again, as I said before, whether you are watch this show because you know Mason or you're his generation, you're his age, get out and vote. If you're our mm-hmm. generation, get out and vote. If you're if you're retired and all that, please get out and vote, uh, regardless of what you think. Uh, you can really make a difference. You know, people always say my vote doesn't matter. Yes, it it does. definitely matters in a local and uh, district election like this. That is one of your most powerful tools that you have, is taking your voice to the voting booth. And if you want to complain in the next two years, even if you, it doesn't go your way, at least you can say, I tried, I voted, so that's I have the right. right to be able to voice my opinion. So. Absolutely. Well, that's it. Thanks, Marsha. Good luck to you, and we'll see you guys next time on the Mason Miller Show.